Tonight, another object shot down from the sky, this time near Ontario. What's gone on the last two weeks or so, 10 days, has been uh, nothing short of craziness. The latest from Canadian and U.S. officials. They advise us not to come here. Brothers traveled to the quake zone in search of their missing Canadian sister. I was extremely disappointed with how the Canadian Embassy was handling this. My conversation with Mark Critch on finding a human touch in political comedy. The question I wanted to ask you is, where around here can a fella You're kidding. light up? <laughs> you didn't. This is The National with Ian Hennemanzi. For the third time in three days and the fourth in just over a week, another unidentified object has been shot down over North America, this time over Lake Huron. The order came from the U.S. president. Justin Trudeau ordered one of the targets shot down over Yukon on Saturday. As both countries keep eyes trained on the sky, questions are mounting on the ground about what exactly is going on. Katie Simpson takes us through what details are emerging as more investigations get underway. A rare Sunday appearance for the Prime Minister. Good morning, everyone. Underscoring the urgency of the situation at hand. The safety of Canadians is our number one priority, and that's why I made the decision to shoot down the object that was uh, a threat to civil aviation and a potential threat to Canadians. Justin Trudeau gave the order himself to take out an unidentified flying object over the Yukon on Saturday, one of four in North American airspace in the last nine days. The latest was brought down this afternoon over Lake Huron. American and Canadian airspace was temporarily restricted, allowing a U.S. fighter jet to shoot it. The Pentagon worried it could spy on military sites and posed a threat to civilian aircraft. About 24 hours earlier, an American fighter jet took out the one over the Yukon. Debris is scattered in a remote area near Dawson City. Recovery will be difficult because of the terrain. The FBI is helping the RCMP, Canadian Armed Forces and Indigenous communities. On Friday over Alaskan airspace, an object the size of a small car was downed over the frigid waters of the northeastern part of the state. And off the coast of South Carolina, a week ago Saturday, a Chinese spy balloon was shot out of the sky. What's gone on the last, uh, you know, two weeks or so, ten days, has been uh, nothing short of um, craziness. The Pentagon now says the Chinese spy balloon is different than the other objects and that radar is being closely scrutinized out of an abundance of caution. I would prefer them to be trigger happy than to be permissive. What I think this shows, which is probably more important to our policy discussion here, is that we really have to declare that we're going to defend our airspace. Politicians in both countries are seeking greater clarity from officials in the hopes that conspiracy theories don't fill the void. I looked at social media this morning, you know, all of a sudden, massive speculation about alien invasions and, you know, additional Chinese action yeah. or Russian action. Uh, in the absence of information, people's anxiety leads them into uh, potentially destructive areas. And Katie, tell us what the Pentagon said in their update tonight. What really stood out, Ian, is just how little information there is. They don't even know how these objects stay in the air. They say that they're not calling them balloons for a reason. And in that light, because there is such little information, uh, journalists were asking all kinds of questions. It was even put to the U.S. Air Force general whether he could rule out whether space aliens are involved. Remember, conspiracy theories run rampant down here. The Pentagon says there's no evidence of that, but what may fuel some of that talk is that the general wouldn't rule out anything at this time. Thanks, Katie. Thanks. John Tory's resignation as mayor of Toronto is still reverberating across Canadian politics. Tonight, a city with a lot of hard problems to solve has hard questions about the conduct that will soon send them to the polls. Lisa Shing has the story. The mayor of Canada's largest city still making public appearances, but not for much longer. I recognize that permitting this relationship to develop was a serious error in judgment. Following a report by the Toronto Star of an affair with a subordinate, a staffer at the time and decades younger, John Tory announced he's stepping down. It is important, as I always have, for the office of the mayor not to be in any way tarnished and not to see the city government itself put through a period of prolonged controversy. But a controversy it already is, especially since Tory was seen as a steady successor after the tumult of the Rob Ford years. I thought he finally had a normal mayor. Obviously this is like stalling city government in a way that's like really inconvenient, but I'm hoping that it like 
gets us something that's actually going to like move the city forward. Thank you. Tory's resignation comes at a precarious time where there's growing public concern about crime on the city's transit system, homelessness and affordability. And just after the province had granted Toronto strong mayor powers, giving the ability to pass decisions even with minority support, that makes his soon-to-be vacant seat an opportunity for his political opponents. We have to be honest about our tax rate. We have to be honest about reinvesting into the services and infrastructure that has been allowed to deteriorate for too many years. Some continue to slam Tory's personal conduct. It's definitely an abuse of power. Like... Going after a 30-year-old girl who's directly below you is just inappropriate in any way. Even without many details, there are questions oh about that power imbalance. Does the other person, do they see it as consensual? Do they feel it is consensual? Can they say no? The city's integrity commissioner is looking into the relationship, and once Tory submits his resignation letter, the clock on the by-election to replace him could start as early as Wednesday. Lisa Shing, CBC News, Toronto. In Turkey tonight, one more amazing rescue. <laughs> this is the triumph of hope over despair. A week after deadly quakes struck Turkey and Syria, workers pulled a 44-year-old man to safety. He'd been trapped for 162 hours. In that time, the death toll in Turkey and Syria has pushed past 33,000 lives. Turkish police have arrested contractors as questions are raised about possible substandard building practices in a system that's widely seen as corrupt and ineffective. Now you'll see how people are taking things into their own hands, including a pair of Canadian brothers. They've joined together in Turkey looking for a life that may hang in the balance. They're sisters. Here's Briar Stroop. Look at the foundational structure. And of course, Muthana Zora knew it was an act of desperation, but when thermal equipment detected something that was warmer than the surrounding rubble, he had to try to get underneath. And he said, we're going to dig here. I went in there with three local Turks men. He was looking for his 33-year-old sister, Samer. She was in Turkey doing research for her PhD. Muthana spoke to her a few days before the quake but no one has heard anything since. When her family found out that Antakya was devastated, they made frantic calls. But Salmer's twin brother, Saad, said they didn't get much help from the Canadian government. I was extremely disappointed with how the Canadian embassy was handling this. They, they just asked for her information and uh, sent us emails to contact and send the information there. They advised us not to come here. But they did anyway. Saad right flew from there, Halifax, right Muthana from Kuwait. At least here they could talk to people and connect with search and rescue groups. Canada, Canada, that's in Canada. So there's two floors down. That's where Salmer was staying. But there isn't the equipment needed to be able to get down there. The brothers have been told it could be weeks before crews excavate the site. This city was one of the hardest hit, but help was slow to arrive. No, this, is, this is our situation, but this is uh, one of thousands. Uh, we're you know, sitting with and, and crying with local Turkish people, them talking about the people they've lost, the people that are missing in, in their life because of this earthquake. And uh, it, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking. Saad and one of Summer's friends have been going to hospitals checking patient lists. The brothers even went to a burial ground, but they believe their sister is still trapped. They say they'll stay until they can bring their sister's body back to Canada. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Diyarbakir, Turkey. Tonight, tons of emergency supplies from the World Health Organization are being deployed in Turkey and in Syria. Well, it's uh, heartbreaking, the damage and the impact on the people. A third flight was scheduled to arrive in Syria today with emergency surgical supplies and medicine to treat pneumonia. The WHO says it's spending $16 million to provide relief in both countries. But Syrian and Turkish communities across Canada are worried about the level of aid getting through. Kobino Oduro on how they're pulling together to collect and send donations. 
Nous demandons au gouvernement canadien de faire... Syrian Quebecers are raising their voices for humanitarian aid, for survivors of the civil war and of last week's devastating earthquake. We have been witnessing on TV the slow death of our fellow Syrians without any single help being uh, reaching the most affected areas in north, northwestern Syria. They are demanding the borders open so their families can receive aid. It's not fair to, 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 to leave 4 million, 4.7 million in northwest Syria without help. So we feel we are not fine, we are not good. Even as they lose hope for those beneath the rubble, they remain positive that the right amount of aid relief could save survivors, currently living without shelter, food or medicine. It's freaking cold, you know. It's there's babies, there's mothers, there's there's pregnant women. There's it's you know it's it's beyond beyond speech. It's, I I feel like we, we we literally feel troubled. Turkish Quebecers are also working to get donations. The organization Turk Quebec is hoping to send three shipments a week to Istanbul and says it plans to collect from across the province. Similar efforts can be seen around Canada. The information is the donations have been way more than uh, what the Turkish Airlines can immediately take, but that is okay because earthquake recovery is very long term. In Toronto, a youth hockey team spent their Saturday packing up donations destined for Turkey. It just feels great helping people in need, knowing like I can just help them. Like they need it, so we can provide for them. Organizers from Turkish and Syrian communities across Canada say they'll keep up their calls for help for as long as it takes. Kubino Duro, CBC News, Montreal. Canada's premiers will meet tomorrow to talk about Ottawa's plan for health care. More than $46 billion in new money is on the table, spread out over 10 years. Among the many issues, not enough doctors. Yet, as J.P. Tasker explains, Canada is passing on hundreds of qualified physicians. There's an acute shortage of doctors in Canada, and yet Toronto-born students like Jacob Portnoff are struggling to practice their profession. It's hard to, to, to hear and, and to know that many Canadians and internationals, of course, are, that are qualified for the Canadian system are being um, turned aside. With so few medical school spots in Canada, Portnoff went abroad to Australia. He's not alone. Nearly a thousand Canadian students do the same every year. When they try to come home, they're often told there's no residencies available which is required to be licensed. There's so many students who are trying to obtain this very valuable uh, Canadian clinical experience, which is crucial for their application, and there's not enough seats. Canada is passing up hundreds of homegrown doctors like Portnoff. Last year, fewer than 30% of international graduates were matched with the residency. You have to be a Canadian to even apply. 1,200 qualified Canadian doctors were cut loose. This expert says the system is discriminatory. Medical schools decide who gets a residency. They favor their own students, leaving those trained abroad at a serious disadvantage. There's a don't come home attitude by Canada. They, the words are cute because they say, oh, you're welcome. You're welcome, wanted and welcome to come home to Canada. But when you look at the barriers, they are very clear that you should not come home, go away, and so they do. The federal Liberal government just announced some $46 billion in new health care spending. In exchange for that cash, critics say Ottawa should demand the provinces do more to streamline foreign credential recognition. It should happen within 60 days, not within six or seven years. The Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons say they're working on a solution Experts say a real fix will require an end to bias against foreign trained students and a lot more money, something that's in short supply. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. Right now, Canadian experts are preparing new guidelines for treating childhood obesity. And that has many taking a critical look at how they've recently been updated in the U.S. Alison Northcott looks at that aggressive approach for kids as young as 12. It's been three years since 12-year-old Christopher Legault started treatment for obesity. At eight, his mother says his weight was already having a major impact on his quality of life. It was always like crying and say, I want to I want to play, I want to play soccer, but I can't. I'm running and I'm having so much difficulties. Getting bullied by other people, I felt like ashamed about my weight because it's like 
they made me like less confident about myself. And that really, really like hurt me. The program he's been following at a Montreal clinic involves intensive lifestyle and nutrition treatment, learning habits to suit his body's needs. It makes me proud that I made a lot of progress. It's the kind of early intensive intervention recommended in new U.S. guidelines to treat childhood obesity. But the guidelines are controversial because the American Academy of Pediatrics also recommends weight loss drugs and bariatric surgery for kids as young as 13 with severe obesity, a body mass index of 35 or more. We cannot watch these, you know, these kids really struggle and, and you know, their health is at jeopardy without offering them, you know, some solutions. In Canada, where about 1 in 10 children have obesity, updated treatment guidelines are in the works. Children living with obesity are at risk of high blood pressure, they're at risk of cholesterol problems, they're at risk of diabetes. Dr. Melanie Henderson says lifestyle changes are a crucial first line of defense and should be prioritized, but she says that doesn't work for all kids. There is a subset of children who, despite making all their efforts, still are living with very severe obesity and very severe complications associated with the obesity and for whom pharmacotherapy and bariatric surgery are options that need to be discussed openly. But some worry weight loss drugs and surgery for teens turn the focus away from prevention. The concern is, uh, is that these are simply band-aid solutions and that we really need to get to the root cause of why these children are overweight and obese. He says that includes socioeconomic factors like access to healthy, affordable food. But the focus of the coming Canadian guidelines is on treating obesity. They're expected later this year. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Some big moments for football fans tonight. The Kansas City Chiefs beat the Philadelphia Eagles for the Vince Lombardi Trophy at Super Bowl 57. But for some, it's not about the game, it's the halftime show. And Rihanna lit up the stage, performing live for the first time in seven years. A much-anticipated performance for her fans. A couple of notable firsts in the game. The first time each team was led by a black quarterback. And the first time brothers faced each other. But off the field, there was another significant first. Stephanie Mercier looks at the Indigenous man from Saskatchewan who was part of it. Patrick Mitsuing is no stranger to the stage, but for this one, he is. I'm still pinching myself, you know, that I, I'm here and I'm part of everything. Mitsuing is Cree from Makwa Sagagan First Nation in Saskatchewan. He performs the traditional men's fancy dance and runs a dance company. This week, he's showing tens of thousands of football fans what he can do. This year, the Super Bowl invited performers like Mitsuing to showcase Indigenous culture in the lead-up to the game. At an event last week, for the first time, league officials read a land acknowledgement. I feel like, you know, long overdue, but like so excited that they're doing it. But some want much more change. While a couple of pro teams have discarded controversial nicknames, Kansas City still uses one, the Chiefs, and uses a fan chant, the Tomahawk Chop. Indigenous groups say it's cultural appropriation, and the team is the focus of repeated protests. I just want to be seen as a human being and not as this thing you're mocking. Groups like Not In Our Honor advocate against the use of Native American imagery in sport and hope positive steps like this aren't just a token. What's going to happen after Super Bowl leaves? Are they still going to carry this on? I would hope so. Um, and we would hope so going forward with other Super Bowls. Mitsuing feels change is coming. I know when I was growing up, it was hard for me to find someone I could look up to that looked like me. And... Uh, you know, now we're taking up all these spaces and, and being included, it, it's so amazing. Amazing, he says, for this and the next generation to see. Stephanie Mercier, CBC News, Vancouver. Shoppers for Instacart are questioning how the company pays them for their service. So I only got paid a couple bucks for the, for the shopping. That doesn't seem right. Why workers say their pay is unclear and unfair. The wartime Jeep that connected two families from across the world. I was happy, I was shocked, and I was also sad. And... Has this always been here? He's known for sending up politicians. Now Mark Critch takes on a more personal role. And I'm 
in my father's body. And I think, what the hell have you done? You madman. We're back in two seconds. For some of you, your morning coffee is getting an inflation jolt. Starting tomorrow, Starbucks is rolling out new rules for its loyalty program. Some items will require twice as many stars or points. Tim Hortons also updating its rewards program. Beginning later this month, it will be more expensive to earn free goodies. Tonight, workers at a major grocery delivery service are questioning how they're paid and whether the system is fair. Instacart shoppers in Canada can't see their full pay details and have to take the company's word they're being paid the promised rates. So they've asked Go Public to investigate. Here's what Carolyn Dunn found out. Josh Rigo has been shopping and delivering groceries for Instacart for a year. But just months into the gig, he noticed he wasn't getting paid as much as he'd expected. Shoppers are told they get a minimum of $7 per batch and 40 cents per kilometre for delivery. So I only got paid a couple bucks for the, for the shopping. That doesn't seem right. According to Instacart, it is right. It's shoppers who are confused. The total batch payment is inclusive of this mileage component, not in addition to, Instacart said in a statement. Confused? Well, so was Josh, but the company says shoppers are told in advance what their total compensation will be. But unlike most Canadian workers, the full breakdown of their pay is not shown to them. Now when shoppers ask for mileage details from support agents, they're told, we can't show you the breakdown, but your pay is correct. You should know what you're getting paid and what the breakdown is. Employment lawyer Sheila Turkington says transparency in pay is a minimum entitlement. How does a worker know they're getting paid fully the entitlement? Or is a worker accepting the work under false pretenses? Hey, Lucien here. Shopper Lucien Mihalesco says he's left in the dark about why his earnings appear to be shrinking over the last couple of years. And then starting January, everything went down like half. He's recorded a series of videos to lobby Instacart using months of his own order stats to support his case, to no avail. I'm thinking seriously if I, if I should go back to this job because it's pay so low and uh, it's lack of transparency and lack of respect for us shoppers. Rigo is disappointed with Instacart's response too. It's the shoppers who make this whole app possible. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. Syrian doctors are pleading for help as they struggle to treat the thousands injured after the earthquake. He's doing 50 cases a day. Uh, it's overwhelming uh, just to keep up with the crush injuries. An exclusive look inside a Syrian hospital, trying to keep people alive with few resources. And the man unafraid to confront prime ministers. Wondering, the question I wanted to ask you is, where around here can a fella You're kidding. light up? <laughs> Mark Critch talks comedy in a polarized world. Twitter isn't real, right? And politicians aren't real. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping your world. Next. Medical aid is flowing into Turkey from around the world, but in Syria, it has been slower in coming. Border restrictions and a heavy-handed regime have choked supply routes. A surgeon sent us this video with his desperate plea. No medical equipment, no food. Five days after the Arctic week, nothing. I want to see for everybody to help us uh, as fast as possible. There's only one border crossing in northwest Syria that's open to humanitarian aid. Today, the UN's top emergency relief coordinator was there. Martin Griffiths says more access points are needed. Within Syria, the UN has been widely criticized for its slow response to the earthquake. But some help from Canada will soon be on the way. Katie Nicholson gives us an exclusive glimpse inside struggling Syrian hospitals and meets a Syrian-Canadian doctor determined to make a difference. In a place of chaos, a call from a place of safety, surgeon to surgeon. How are you doing today? 
he's doing 50 cases a day. Uh, it's overwhelming uh, just to keep up with the crush injuries. Anas al Qasem's friend, Samia Kador, has been operating around the clock since the earthquake struck. His Syrian hospital sustained damage, but there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> Hundreds of patients have had to be sent home because hospitals just don't have the capacity to care for them. They have significant lack of antibiotics and painkillers and anesthesia drugs. Northern Syrian hospitals were already in hard shape before the earthquake, after years of civil war, closed and restricted borders, and a regime accused of diverting aid from the region. But these images, shared by doctors on the ground, show makeshift hospital wards packed with survivors. A system on the brink of collapse. Patients being treated with dwindling supplies, like painkillers, while others line outside, suffer and wait. So these are crash injuries. They need a complex uh, health care. Uh, hypothermia is a big deal. Uh, they need admission to the ICU. Many of them, they need intubation, evacuation of subdural hematoma or uh, abdominal uh, bleeding. The need is now critical, and it will continue. But the next phase, uh, you're going to need to do more reconstructive surgery and more plastic surgery for, for the limbs injuries. But the concern after that is that these uh, fragile communities will be exposed to infectious uh, diseases such as cholera and, and so forth. Now al Qasem and a small team from Canada and the U.S. are heading in to help, something he's done many times before during the Syrian war. I saw that firsthand when I used to go to Aleppo and to Idlib uh, for many medical missions in the last 10 years. They really appreciate when you come and let them relax and give them some social support. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the surgeries, you know, we, we kind of work around the clock doing uh, scheduled surgeries. And before he goes in, an urgent appeal from the people he hopes to relieve. He's asking the Canadian government, the Canadian people, to send supplies immediately as soon as possible. And he's counting on Canada. And counting on surgeons like al Qasem, even if just for a few days. And Katie, what are doctors telling you about what's happening inside Syrian hospitals? Well, they are just buckling under the pressure. You have to realize many of the medical staff that have been working 24-7, they've only been getting about four hours sleep a night. They're just inundated with people. Uh, m more than a third of the cases are, are women and children. They talk about how, uh, how difficult it is with the children. It's heartbreaking. Some have lost their parents. Um, you hear them crying perhaps a little bit in the, that story there. And, and those are the sounds that they're dealing with every day, people crying out. Um, and they're saying that the patients who survive, they are going to need rehabilitation, they're going to need prostheses, long-term care, add to that the need on the ground for food, shelter, electricity. All of this, doctors say, points to a need to keep that border with Turkey open and porous for years to come. Katie, thank you. You're welcome. Coming up, the push to make Zambonis green. Electric vehicles no longer just for the roads, but first. Mike Critch live on the scene at Coleman's Grocery in St. John. Mark Critch takes on a familiar role. My conversation with the famed comic is next. We are backstage at 22 Minutes with one of the stars. Mark Critch, how you doing? Great. This is a prop room. We need lots of props. This is Canada, so you need a curling stone. But look, it's fake. My hand is fake. It's all lies, like politics. It's not all lies, but uh, we have lots of questions for Mark right after this. There's a few unnecessary things in schools nowadays, you know. Mark Critch comes from that long line of great Newfoundland comics. A big baby, a big baby. John Bear just ran away from me. He ran onto the national stage 20 years ago, chasing politicians on This Hour has 22 minutes. All right, you go uh, get your chopper. Love you, buddy. Porn actors to... Taking the news and adding a punchline. Saying they have no idea how the bugs got in the soup, since everyone knows insects come with the chili. <laughs> 
And now his second primetime show, bringing his quirky childhood to life, now in its second season. Mary! I don't have all day here, what is it? He's a busy guy, but he took a break to chat on the 22 minute set in Halifax. So you've been a performer on this program for almost 20 years. So you've gone from being the youngest guy in every room to like maybe the oldest guy. How does that feel? It's interesting because I still think of myself as a young guy. Yeah. 22 was such a thing when I joined 10 years in that I always felt like I was house sitting and trying to fit into it and not really uh, get in the way or, or not be too much of yourself. And it's like house sitting and you're afraid to put your feet up on the table and then you realize, oh, I've been here a while, I can put my feet up on the table and the actual owners never come back. So now it's just you're, you're squatting. That's what I feel like. I feel like at any moment now, Rick and Mary will come back and say, what are you doing here? Get out of here. And given all the skits you've done, all the interviews you've done, uh, how, how has that changed you? Like, you find yourself like angrier, calmer? What, what would you say? I probably think all the interviews and stuff I've done have made me calmer. I think at first it seems like you're in there to slay a dragon. You know, the prime minister is, you know, he's this big creature. He's this, he's this historical figure and you're just some little comedian from Newfoundland and you gotta insult him on the run. Did your parents put you in boxing lessons so that Joe Clark's daughter would stop beating you up? <laughs> and now the prime minister, Justin Trudeau, whom I've been interviewing from before he was even in politics. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, you're this guy, okay, and you've been through this thing, and I, I have an understanding of you as a person more so than the institution of being the prime minister. Uh, I'm just wondering, the question I wanted to ask you is, where around here can I tell you? You're out? kidding. Like, yeah. <laughs> and then I, I realize that people are just now people trying to do their best, might have differences of opinion than you, but generally they're thinking that it's their way is the right way or, or trying to survive. So yeah, it's, I think it's less black and white and more gray, the world, as, as the more I, I learn about it through talking to people. Yeah, it's funny, you, you think the world you know, is more gray, but, but outside of your head, it, it feels more polarized than ever. I mean, as a satirist, as a comedian, does that make it tougher? Uh, I think people are in the middle. I, I think real people, like Twitter, isn't real. Right? And politicians aren't real. And pundits aren't real. Especially in this world where things are um, hyper divisive one side or the other. And I, I think but the average person you meet, they're just trying to make ends meet. And I, I think really the reality is uh, grayer than media would have it appear to be. But when you finish, when, when an episode of 22 Minutes, for example, airs, like, is there a moment where you kind of think, okay, I, I'm not sure if I want to look at my phone now or watch, uh, you know, whatever the reaction is and kind of... I used to be like that. I used to be way more into Twitter and stuff mm -hmm. like that, you know? And I'd be fighting back with people and they'd say something. I'd say, that's not true. And, nah, and I go, oh, I got that person. And then I realized, what am I doing? Because when you get out in the real world, nobody knows what you're talking about. Yeah. It's, a, it's a small group. Um, in the old days... I used to get letters. I've been doing this long enough. I used to get letters mm -hmm. and or postcards. And man, you've got to be pretty upset with someone mm -hmm. to go, ah, that critch. Where's that film? Nova Scotia <laughs> on Bell Road, you say? Oh, well, what's the postal code for that? Well, I'm going to buy a stamp. And that's when you're, they're mad. But when anybody can just fire something off, what I find is I think I'm being fair if, if I get a bunch of people who are liberal saying, um, I pick on Justin too much, and then a bunch of people who are conservative saying you don't pick on him enough. Mm -hmm. Now, if those numbers are generally about the same, yeah. you'll get, you'll, you're doing all right. Let's take you back to a, a more innocent time before Twitter. Yeah. Um, and, and your audition tape for 22 Minutes. Yes. Which was actually funny. <laughs> That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Thank you very much. Welcome to this audition tape has five minutes. Yeah, I thought, you know, Rick Mercer was leaving. Right, and so people in Newfoundland were like, "Oh, you should try. This is yours. You should do this." Now moving across the uh, island portion of the province, I took my shirt off. I, I went very desperate. I was uh, a weatherman, and I drew a Newfoundland uh, map, weather map on my chest, and I thought, "Okay, I know I can do this because I'd been writing sketches and performing, and I'd been doing uh, like topical commentaries locally, and I thought, okay, well, this this is something. If I can get there, I think I can do it." Hurry, hard, hurry, 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 pour, pour. Can you sign my golf ball? 
Has this always been here? Well, let's talk about Son of a Critch. Uh, first of all, the book, so good, what did I ask you? Did you write it yourself? You did ask me if I had <laughs> ghostwritten like, a, like Prince Harry, but no, I, 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 yeah, I did write it myself. It is a fantastic book and has turned into a beautiful series, like it's poignant and, and it's funny. Four, three. VOC have on the spot news at the liquor store where the scene is sobering. There's so much to ask you about, but, but let me start with this. You, you, you know, your, your old family home is, is, has been recreated for that. Yeah. Obviously scenes from your childhood, your family. What's it like to, 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 to recreate all those scenes from your childhood? It's really, it's, it's bizarre. Cause it's, um, my family home hasn't been there since like the mid nineties, right? Mom and dad are no longer there. And I kind of sketched out what the house was like. And you know, it had to be kind of small and it was right next to this radio station. And um, our art department kind of did it pretty authentically. And then they'd be, I had my dad's uh, kind of clothes he wore. And they were, I showed him pictures. And they're like, okay, we got similar fabric and we've recreated his outfits. I'm like, well, I'm not Churchill. Like nobody's gonna know, <laughs> you know? It's not like, oh, that's not what was worn. Uh, uh, during the Blitz. So I, I was like, well, but it's so strange. I'm wearing my, uh, dad used to wear this red VOCM jacket to work as part of the news team. You know, they all wore red jackets. And, uh, and so I had dad's jacket and I had uh, his gold patches on that. And I'm wearing a recreation, but with dad's actual buttons and patches on it. So sometimes I'll be sitting at the kitchen table and over here is furniture that was actually in our dining room growing up. The, the, the uh, radio on the counter is the one from my childhood home because I, I kept a bunch of this stuff. And I'll look down at myself and peripheral vision, I'm home and I'm in my father's body. And I think, what the hell have you done? Yeah. You madman. <laughs> it's kind of strange. Action. Oh, hell of an article here about the feds. Scissors. It can be melancholy at times, you know, because you miss them and stuff like that. But, um, but then I'll hear, you know, Malcolm and Benjamin laughing or whatever, and I realize they're gone, the house is gone, we have this other shell of a place, and now we're filling it up with new memories. And um, it moves on. And, like, that's a big theme of the show, onwards. You know, you keep going forward. Mike Critch live on the scene at Coleman's Grocery in St. John. So Mike Critch, you know, famous newsman. You must have thought about this. What would, what would he be thinking of, of this program, your portrayal of him? I think Dad would be equal parts delighted and mortified, right? He would, you know, did you have to make it so small? Did you have to talk about that? The house, your mother could be dressed a little nicer, hey? And why did you say I couldn't get a raise? And, but he'd be going around in St. John saying, did you see the kid's show last night? Pretty good, huh? And I'd been making fun of dad. I mean, I first made fun of dad when I was 15, when I rented out a local theater called the LSPU Hall, Longshoreman's Protective Union. And um, I did, did, wore that dad's red jacket and did an impression of dad. And the audience loved it. And I've been doing the same thing <laughs> since I was 15. Um, and you know, and you make fun of your parents, you make fun of your teachers. I'm still doing that. And then, you know, at some point the principal of the school becomes a prime minister. So it's always just been, I'm doing the same thing I was doing when I was 15, just making fun of the powerful people in my life. Because I didn't do my homework. We feel like we know the young you from your book and, yeah. and, and from the show. Um, and, and, and I, I, I wonder about the young Mark Critch. What, what could he even have dreamed? That, that the adult would be doing this job now? What would he have thought? The fact that I would be talking about my family and have a show, that would, I couldn't even have imagined that. And, and every now and then, I mean, I, it hits you every, so you just, it's a job, you're going forward. Every now and then you stop and go, oh wow, that's, that's so strange. I, I couldn't have imagined uh, things working out better at that age, you know. I would have been happy just to be doing kids' birthday parties. I just wanted to get on stage. Everything about you is so unique. You're a Newfoundlander. You've got two primetime shows. One of them is being shot in Halifax. You've got two books. What's next? What's your plan? I, you know, I've never had a plan. <laughs> I've kind of like uh, let life happen, you know. I kind of follow and go forward and find out what's interesting. I always assumed at different points, well, it's not going to get better than this, right? Like I was making a living in St. John's 
when I got this, I was 28. At that point, I thought, oh, okay, well, it's not going to, I'm making a living. Okay. I can keep food on the table. Okay. It's not going to get better than this. And I got 22, and I thought, well, it's not going to get better than this. And then now the books and the, and, and, I, and the other TV show, I mean, that's, I could never have imagined that. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't imagine it getting better than this. But uh, I still want to try new things because I, I, I didn't think any of this would work. So, eh, give it a shot. If you fail, who cares? It's Canada. No one will even know if you're successful, let alone if you fail. How are they going to find out? Well, we all know you're a funny guy. You're an immensely talented guy in so many ways. Thank so you. you deserve it all. So good for you. Thank you. And you're not doing so bad for an East Coast young fella either, hey? Right? Oldest guy in the room. <laughs> Oldest guy in the room, right? It's our time. It was so much fun spending like about a day and a half on the 22 minute set. So much talent in Halifax. That show developed so much talent in Halifax. And Critch is funny just all the time between takes when, you know, after we did the interview, just a very, very funny guy. Coming up next, the Jeep used in the Second World War that's driving a connection between Canada and the Netherlands. I said, yeah, I think we got your father's army Jeep. And that's how the story continues. The story that has a veteran's name written all over it in our moment. It's a ritual at indoor skating rinks across Canada, that resurfacing machine circling the ice, making it smooth and shiny. But in its wake is a dirty little secret, indoor air pollution. Emily Chung shows us how climate-friendly technology is helping clear the air. Skating and hockey are good exercise and good fun for these teens. But at this rink in Mississauga, there's plenty of entertainment, even when you're off the ice. Most ice resurfacers in Canada run on natural gas or propane. Burning those generates nitrogen oxides, the same pollutants produced by gas stoves. They're linked to respiratory problems like asthma. But this one is electric, and that could make a big difference to the air these kids are breathing. Between 2017 and 2020, Health Canada measured indoor air quality at 16 rinks in Ottawa and Saskatchewan. At seven of those rinks, nitrogen oxides were sometimes above Health Canada's short-term exposure limits. Those levels climbed through the day and only dropped part way overnight. So at the very start of a day in an ice arena, they're sometimes double, three, four times the level outside the building before they even do one resurfacing of the arena. An electric resurfacer changed that. When we switched to electric, it was continuously at or below the outdoor limits. So you drew it, knocked it down 10 to 20 times by switching over to an electric very quickly. So it was a great way to remove the pollution in a building. It's been a trend across the country, from North Couch in BC to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and to Mississauga, Ontario, despite the higher upfront cost. To the extent that we can electrify our fleet, we want to switch over to electric. And that, of course, moves us away from the combu internal combustion engines, away from other types of fuel, pollution. And of course, it's uh, a more climate friendly solution for our ice rinks. In the old days when I started, you could always smell the propane from the old Zambonis, and that wasn't a very good hockey rink smell. So I think it's pretty cool, no pun intended, but it's a breath of fresh air making arenas a little greener, cleaner, and healthier. Emily Chung, CBC News, Mississauga. And here's a throwback to a vehicle from the Second World War. This Jeep was used by New Brunswick's Buck Sear when he served with the Canadian Signal Corps. That Jeep made its way from the beaches of Normandy to the Netherlands, and now, nearly a century later, it's being reconnected with the family of the man who drove it. And tonight, it's our moment. Six months ago, I uh, bought it as a present for the present for the family. We had it uh, take it out for a spin on a sunny day, and uh, the sun was shining in the steering wheel, and we saw some scratching. And then we saw a name, Buck Sire, Ken Belton, NB, New Brunswick. We found out a Facebook article. I said, yeah, I think we got your father's army jeep. Well, he had sent me a picture, so I mentioned from the back, and I said, yes, that is definitely my father. I was happy. I was shocked and I was also sad. Sad that my dad had just passed four years earlier. He landed in the beach of Normandy the second day after. He went from France into Brussels. He went into Holland. 
you got it up and running, yeah, then you also need to take step two and make it completely or original Canadian again. All the markings are back on the Jeep as it was. My grandson, who happens to be named Ewan Buck McCormick, is going over next year on a school trip and he's going to be taking the same journey. One thing or another, he must drive his Jeep. Then the circle is in my eyes complete. Whatever it takes, he will drive the Jeep. Everything about that story is so incredible, including the fact that it came ashore during the Normandy invasion. And uh, Buck did go back to the Netherlands. He did sit in a Jeep. His family said, is that your Jeep? He says, no, because I wrote my name on mine. And so remarkable that it was eventually found and that the family in the Netherlands contacted him. That is The National for February the 12th. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night.